Hi there. A bit unexpectedly, Kaiweeds contacted me if I wanted to review their Cats 02 soldering iron. Well, why not? I have never tried one of these USB driven irons with cartridge tips and I'm quite interested in finding out how well they work. As the package shows, this is a 65 watt iron and comes with 6 tips and a USB charger that supports power delivery or PD 3.0. In the box is a manual, a cardboard box and under the cardboard box is a very beefy USB charger, the soldering iron itself and a metal cap that can be used to protect and cover a possibly still hot tip when transporting the iron. Very nice. The cardboard box contains a very sturdy USB-C to USB-C cable, a tiny stand with a sponge and six tips of various shapes. The UK USB adapter has a USB-C and a USB-A port and proudly displays its 65 watts GAN standing for gallium nitrate. GAN just means that probably the switching transistors are using gallium nitrate which reduces losses. The only other text on the charger is this small print which is pretty comprehensive as far as specs are concerned. The model is RYU65A. Its USB-C output alone supports 5, 9, 12, 15, all up to 3 amps and 20 volts up to 3.25 amps for 65 watts. The USB-A port alone does up to 30 watts. Sensibly, the last lines show the limits of using both ports together, which is 45 watts for USB-C and 12 watts for USB-A. Notably absent are any markings or logos of safety certifications, not even a CE mark or UKCA. Hmm. For what it's worth, I've run a full capacity test on the USB-C for an extended period and no complaints. I also found a teardown of an RYU65A on a Vietnamese YouTube channel and it looked pretty well made. A closer look at the six tips that came with the iron. They are... A BC2, which is a medium wedge or bevel shape and close to what I normally use in other irons. A BC3, which is a large wedge or bevel shape. A B2, which is a medium conical shape. A tip called ILS, which is a fine conical shape. A KR, which is a medium knife tip. And finally the K65, which is a large knife tip. All in all, that covers probably most situations from SMD to through hole. For my tests, I picked the BC2. The size of the metal part is about 89 mm, excluding the actual tip bit. There is a rim pretty much in the middle, which limits how far you can insert it into the iron. The total length is about 100 mm. The metal part with the two white insulation rings form three contacts. The two metal rings on the top have a resistance of about 7 ohms and are obviously connected to the heating element inside. The rest of the metal body has a fairly high resistance of some mag ohms against the heater. I assume that this is somehow providing the contact through the temperature sensor. The diameter is about 5.5 mm. The question in my mind was whether there are compatible tips out there. And it seems we are in luck. The tips for a GD300 soldering iron seems to look identical, but will they work? Only one way to find out, and so I bought two GD300 tips. And the tips for the Finercy HS01 soldering iron also look as if they could work. So I bought another BC2 tip for an HS01 to see if it works. But while these extra tips are on the way, time to explore the soldering iron further. When powered on, in standby, the display shows that the left button will activate the iron. Pressing both buttons brings the menu, starting with brightness. It took me a while to understand what these strange texts CT left and CA on the right mean. They are actually the last two characters of the previous menu title on the left and the first two characters on the next menu on the right. See, if I advance, the CA turns out to be Calibrate, and the SS on the left is the last part of Brightness. Cute, but honestly, I think this may cause more confusion than being helpful, but that's just me. Anyway, back to Brightness. 
a long press gets you into the menu to adjust the screen brightness. The calibrate menu allows you to calibrate the temperature if you find that the readout differs from the actual measured temperature. Next, we have the selection of the temperature unit allowing a choice between Celsius and Fahrenheit. This is followed by the sleep time allowing you to select a timeout after which the iron will go to sleep if it wasn't used. You can also turn the sleep completely off. The next setting is of course the temperature the iron drops to when sleeping. I set that to 150 degrees Celsius or 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Then there is a child lock. Normally the iron starts heating with a single click on the left button. Apparently if you enable child lock it needs three clicks before heating up, but I have not tried that myself. Next is handheld, where you can set if you are right handed or left handed. If set to left handled the screen flips by 180 degrees and the buttons are swapped. The last setting is Vol Select, which is not volume, but voltage. This allows you to select a lower voltage. You may need to do that if you are using a power source that doesn't support the 20 volts 3.25 amps, for example a power bank. And that is it. Oh, and by the way, notice the CA on the right, but the next screen is actually brightness, not calibrate. You start the iron with a click on the left button, and you can see it heating up very fast. On the right you see the target is 330 degrees or 626 degrees Fahrenheit and that 20 volts are used. The bar on the bottom shows the power drawn by the iron. The power bar is updated so fast that it appears quite jumpy. Once the temperature is reached and no soldering is going on, the power draw reduces drastically just to what's needed to maintain the temperature. You can adjust the temperature using the left and right buttons. So if I reduce it to 300 degrees Celsius, the power consumption is zero until the temperature drops to the new target. And of course, if I set it to a higher value, more power is drawn to get quickly to the new temperature. The iron remembers the last set temperature and uses that as a target when powered up. By the way, a long press on the right button turns the heat off and puts it in standby. It took me a long time to film the iron going to sleep, not only because I had left the sleep timer at the default of 20 minutes, but because it's extremely sensitive and the smallest vibration on the table from doing other work was enough to prevent the iron from sleeping. As I said, a small bump on the table wakes it up. I wish it would be a bit less sensitive and only do it when picked up again. As you see, the iron gets back to the target temperature very quickly and I was interested how quickly, because it seems to show reaching the target temperature even when the power consumption shows it has not reached equilibrium. To do that, I use the thermal imaging camera to record the temperature over time, but I need the soldering iron to not move, so put it in a vise. The tip is still slightly warm from failed freehand earlier experiments, but I wait for everything to cool down. Not visible here is that I also added the TC66C USB tester to record the voltage current and power in watts in the USB-C connection to the soldering iron. The normal camera is recording the display and unfortunately had not tightened the vise strong enough, but it turned out that wasn't a problem. The target was 350 degrees Celsius or 660 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what I normally use for soldering non-lead-free stuff. It took just 8 seconds for the display to show 350 degrees, but at the same time the power bar is still at almost 50%. Over the next 20 seconds or so, the power bar gradually diminishes until it reaches the equilibrium state of adding just enough to keep the temperature constant. I recorded all this on the Topton TS001 thermal camera, which is excellent for this kind of stuff. It also produced a graph, but I'm more interested in the Excel file that I can export. Here is the result. It's pretty obvious that the display on the iron is a bit on the fast side. It took 30 seconds for the iron to reach the target temperature. To be clear, I'm not complaining. 30 seconds is pretty fast, and quite possibly the sensor reaches the target temperature much faster than the tip. Maybe the next graph will shed some lights on this. Here is a plot of the TC66C recording. There are three traces. The blue one is the voltage, which was 20 volts constant over the test. 
The red one is the current in amps and the yellow one the power in watts. The scale for the amps is on the right y-axis, the scale for volts and watts on the left. This recording uses an interval of 0.5 seconds between measurements. Because the voltage is constant, the shape of the traces for amps and power are identical since power is just volts times amps. It is quite obvious that it takes 30 seconds for the soldering iron to really stabilize on 350 degrees Celsius, but what I find interesting is the fluctuation of the power curve. It really looks as if the processor in the iron gave full power for a few moments, then backed off somewhat and then applied some more, but not as much. After about 8 seconds it repeated this but at a much lower scale. It looks to me as if the sensor said that the heat had reached 350 degrees so the processor backed off, then as the energy spread into the tip and the sensor cooled down, gradually reduced power boosts were added until the whole thing was stable. And in case you want to know, the standby power consumption of the iron is less than a quarter watt. That is when the heat is completely off and only the display is running. All this may be very well and good, but how close is the CATS02 in actually delivering the set temperature to its tip? The thermal image camera is close, but it's quite tricky because the readings depend on a lot of parameters that you can only estimate, for example, emissivity. In a previous video I showed this vintage tool to measure soldering iron temperature, but it's very finicky and it takes many attempts. In this case I never managed to get more than 250 degrees readings with the iron set to 350 degrees Celsius. So I decided to abandon the light salt meter and get one of these. I verified the actual processor in this with a thermal couple calibrator and it was spot on. There might be errors introduced by the actual sensor but it's still very new and it should be okay. 353 degrees Celsius for a target of 350 degrees seems pretty good. Earlier I mentioned that I bought tips for soldering irons that look as if they would work with a CAT02. So far I have been using the Kaiweetz CAT01 BC2 and it works fine. I have done quite a bit of soldering with it and no complaints. What about the Fnersi H02 BC2 then? Only one way to find out. The Fnersi BC2 looks identical to the CAT01 BC2, but will it work? Removing the tip is easy, just remove the nut, pull the old tip out. If doing that by hand, make sure it's cold enough first, ask me how I know. Insert the new tip, the HS01 fits with no problems. And tighten the nut again. Power up and no complaints from the soldering iron. And it powers up just fine, but its temperature reading seems to be all over the place, not sure what's going on there. But eventually it settles on 350 degrees and it seems to work just fine. It did this only the very first time it was powered on and afterwards behaved exactly as the CAT01. I also checked the temperature with the FG100 and it was okay. Maybe some contact problem caused it. Let's test one of the GD300 tips. This is a BC1, so another wedge or bevel shape, but smaller than the BC2 I was using. The GD BC1 looks again exactly like all the tips that came from Kweeds, and the iron accepts it, no problem. Turning it on and it behaves exactly like the CAT01. By the way, the iron does not touch the FG100, it just looks that way. Testing the temperature shows 332 or so as the maximum. Maybe GD tips need a slight recalibration of the iron. Certainly it will solder just fine at 332 degrees. All in all, I think both GD300 and HS01 tips are usable in the CAT02, which is nice to know. I have not mentioned the very nice USB-C cable that comes with the iron. It has these sturdy connectors on both ends. On the iron end, it's just a normal USB-C port. This means the connector is pretty much unsupported and a bit wobbly. Some form of support for the connector would have been nice. On the plus side, the cable does not just feel like silicon, it actually is. Touching it with a 350 degree Celsius hot tip leaves absolutely no marks. 
This is excellent. I want to mention one thing that may be important depending on what you are soldering. Running from an unearthed USB charger, there is a stray voltage issue you need to be aware of. This is a problem with most USB chargers, not specifically this one. My mains voltage is 235 volts and the voltage between the tip and earth is around 95 volts AC. This is caused by capacitive coupling through the Y capacitor that links primary and secondary sides for noise suppression. As long as this capacitor is a proper safety type, this is quite harmless for people because the current is very low, about 50 microamps in this case. When it becomes a problem is if you solder something that is actually earth. Those 95 volts AC may destroy some sensitive semiconductors. Why would you do that, you may ask, but it's actually not that rare, at least in my own experience. I showed this picture when repairing a Datron 1065A multimeter, but there are similar cases for other devices. The problem here is that the calibration data is kept in a battery backed up RAM and the battery is soldered in. This means when replacing it, the multimeter must be running to power the RAM, allowing you to desolder the aging battery and solder in a fresh one. You can't use a mains powered soldering iron since its tip is earthed and it may very well short circuit the battery causing the data to be lost. With USB powered soldering irons there is no danger of shorting the battery but now you have 90 volts AC applied to sensitive meter circuitry that was never designed to handle this and so the potential for damage is much greater. The best way to avoid is to use a beefy power bank to power the iron but I want to show another way which could be handy. You can buy adapters that have a socket for a DC barrel plug on one side and USB-C on the other. Plugging one of these into the rear of the CAT02 allows powering the iron from any DC power source, even a 12 volt car battery if need to be. So far everything is good, but I don't want to finish without doing at least a basic installation test on the included USB charger starting with 500 volts applied between the combined AC input terminals and the combined USB-C DC output. Assistance is higher than the maximum 4 giga ohms this meter can measure, so it's a pass. What about 1000 volts, which is the highest test voltage on this meter? Again, the insulation resistance at 1000 volts is higher than 4 gig ohms, so no issues here. I know I could use my Claire flash tester to run a proper 3000 volts AC test, but I still need this charger and I think I confirmed that it's at least basically okay. But does it still work after 1000 volts? It doesn't explode when applying the mains voltage and without any special PD commands the USB-C port delivers at least 5 volts. Trying the soldering iron next, standby is no problem. And it powers on and heats up like normal using 20 volts, so all is fine. My installation testing has certainly stressed the Y capacitor inside this charger, so it's good to see that the stray voltage is still there, meaning the capacitor has not failed either open or short circuited, and the leak current through the capacitor is still just 5 microamps. Last not least, the cap over the tip. This is really very nice and protects the tip from damage. I don't think it's actually meant to be used when the tip is still hot. Here I applied it after the iron was off for about 30 seconds and the cap is now very noticeable warm. All in all I think the CATS02 is a good soldering iron and I like using it and the flexibility of a tip change. So a special thanks to Kai Wietz for sending it in. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up and it would be great if you decided supporting this channel by becoming a Patreon. Thanks for watching.